They rule the underworld, and their power seems endless. Gang bosses. In Colombia, Pablo Escobar. His illegal drug dealings terrorize an entire country. I'm sure that he believed that he was somehow semi-divine. In Canada, Maurice Boucher, the boss of the Hells Angels, wages a brutal gang war. Car bombs, jail fights, a drug trade worth millions. They're all part of a vicious war. And in Italy, Salvatore Rina, the head of Cosa Nostra, kills everyone who gets in his way. Rina makes the Mafia a terrorist organization. How do investigators get them behind bars? The most powerful gang bosses of all time. In the 1980s, the Mafia controls large parts of the city. And he wants to rise to the very top, John Gotti, a thug from the Bronx. His speciality, robberies and drug trafficking. The FBI uses all its power to crush the Mafia. One of the lead investigators, Special Agent George Gabriel, well, the only way you're going to put the Mafia in jail is you've got to catch them committing their crime. And a big part of their crime, especially when you're the boss of the family, is conversations. It's meeting with people, giving orders. Um, and in order to do that, you either have to get their conversations or you have to put them together. And the meetings are very important to cover. What FBI agent Gabriel does not suspect at the time in December 1985, an assassination will upset the balance of power in the New York underworld. The victim? Paul Castellano, head of the Gambino family and mafia boss number one, shot on the street in plain sight. The way he was killed, there was no doubt in anyone's mind who did it. We knew John Gotti was responsible. We also knew that was a big challenge how we were gonna be able to prove that those guys did it. So it's frustrating when you know who did it and you can't prove that they did it. Witness testimony provides only vague information about 11 alleged culprits wearing Russian hats. Otherwise, nothing. Why did Gotti kill his own boss? His own boss had become distant from the family, had become greedy and so was asking for a lot of money uh, from the members of the family and wasn't sharing as much. And, um, and so there was a lot of uneasiness. Castellano's mistake was that he didn't understand the extent of Gotti's ambition. After the attack in front of Sparks Steakhouse, John Gotti takes power in New York and completely shakes up the Mafia's organization. His goal, to make as much money as possible in the waste management and the construction industry with drug trafficking and racketeering. FBI agents are presented with a challenge to find out who works for Gotti and how his newly structured mafia functions. The mafia is well connected and knows exactly who works for the FBI. And that is what the agents are using to their advantage. We wanted to get in their face, but also we could put pressure on. Because if we went and talked to a wise guy at any time, they're supposed to go back and report that to their boss. We'd wait till we saw them on the street and then pull over, get out of the car, go talk to them. They hated it. Absolutely drove them crazy. The FBI keeps Gotti under surveillance, but he doesn't let it get to him. He presents himself as a man of the people and celebrates himself as New York's open-handed, good-looking Robin Hood. So one of the key features of, of John Gotti 
is that he cared very much about his, uh, his appearance. And so he used to go to the barber every day. He was dressed in a very fashionable way. Got his nickname, the Dapper Don. Tailored suits, expensive cars. Gotti makes about 15 millions a year. At the same time, the Mafia boss mocks the FBI. He bribes juries and hands out death sentences at will. So one of the problems when you bring people like John to trial is they do everything they can to compromise the trial. They try to buy the jurors. They try to intimidate their witnesses. He was very good at being at being acquitted at, at trials. He threatened witnesses, he threatened judges, he threatened prosecutors. Time and again, the FBI tries to take Gotti down. But witnesses all suffer from sudden memory loss. He thought he was untouchable, and so he continued to commit uh, serious crimes, thinking he would never be arrested. In five years, Gotti stands trial three times for drug trafficking and murder. Each time he goes free. Then the presumed big chance. The state of New York itself indicts the gang boss for murdering a union official. But once again, the evidence is spotty. When John got acquitted on that case, when the jury came back not guilty, the pressure really mounted because now John went from the Dapper Don to the Teflon Don. John Gotti gets overconfident. His new mafia headquarters in the middle of downtown New York City, in plain sight of the FBI. I think it was probably a complacency, which is something that comes with power. People believe that they're untouchable, they're unassailable, and Gotti certainly had such an elevated sense of himself. Agent George Gabriel smells his chance. Using a special NASA camera, his team films the Ravenite social club day and night. It's a popular venue for mafiosi, and in the first floor, Gotti's headquarters. For all underworld bosses have to visit the Mafia Dom once a week. When we first started surveilling this club, we didn't know who almost half the people were, because we'd never seen them before. He brought them right into view, so we could take beautiful pictures of them, beautiful video of them, identify them. But what, so what he did was he identified who and what the Gambino family was. And that's something that could take years to do. He did it for us in months. A great boon for investigators. But knowing who works for Gotti is not enough. They have to know what happens behind closed doors at number 247. They use highly sensible directional microphones hidden in the bumper and wheel cases of a car. What the FBI need is proof that he is associated with criminal conspiracies that are carrying out crimes that they have been able to identify. After three months, the breakthrough. The FBI manages to get into the club unnoticed and uses its chance. From now on, they won't miss a single word. Because we know this is where John was conducting his more serious business, we put a bug in the club, which was on the first floor. Then we found out he was using the hallway. So that rack door, down that hallway, he'd come out from behind the club. We put a bug there. We were getting good conversations, but then we found out the secret hiding spot was in one of the apartments two stories up. So he put a bug there. The FBI gathers crucial evidence from the bugs about drug deals, blackmailings, and contract killings. They arrest Gotti. And that was the basis of the trial. And that was uh, how the main evidence was collected over several months of, of the um, uh, orders he was giving to the, to the crew. 14 months later, the trial begins. And investigators now have yet another ace up their sleeve. People decided to go to the police and squeal on him. And in Gotti's case, this is very famous because it's a man named Sammy the Bull Gravano. At that point, Sammy the Bull decided to become a a whistleblower, a witness for the prosecution, and was the key witness 
that, that confirmed what the police had overheard in his club, and that led to his downfall and his uh, conviction for life. Johnny Gravano, long Gotti's closest ally. Now he is a crucial principal witness. When you walk into a courtroom, it's 50-50. Uh, it's like theater. Both sides put on their little movie, and it's kind of a scary feeling that you still have to recognize, as good as it is, you could still lose. But this time, the Teflon Don was played out. The witness confirms 19 murders ordered by Gotti. The sentence, life in prison. The gang boss is finally under lock and key. For FBI agent George Gabriel, Gotti's conviction is the greatest success of his career so far. It was very rewarding at the end to put John Gotti away, to win that trial and put him away for life. After that, while it was a case of a lifetime, and I knew that, there wasn't going to be anybody to chase like John Gotti again. It was going to be boring, and it was. Gotti dies in prison of throat cancer at the age of 61, and thus is finally history. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. But there are more of these gang bosses. He and his group massacred over a thousand people in the space of two or three years. Drugs, blackmail, murder. Gang bosses are addicted to power. Their deeds are among the worst crimes of all time. Canada in the 1990s, a war between biker gangs is raging in Montreal. It's over money and narcotics, a multi-million dollar business. Hell's Angels boss Maurice Boucher uses every means available. He wanted his gang, the Hells Angels, to become the only people involved in selling drugs in the area. Investigator André Bouchard hunts down the gang boss. Mom Boucher was a ruthless killer. A protracted battle begins that will cost many lives. Maurice Boucher's rise begins in 1987. At this time, the Hells Angels control 75% of the drug trade. A war looms between two motorcycle clubs in Montreal. Car bombs, jail fights, a drug trade worth millions. They're all part of a vicious war being fought in and around Montreal between biker gangs. A war over dominance in the cocaine and heroin business. Hells Angels boss Boucher also wants to bring the red light district under his control. To do so, he must eliminate the competition, the rock machine biker gang. André Bouchard's job? Stop the murderous rocker war of Quebec and protect the populace from Maurice Mom Boucher. He was a greedy person. He had no morals at all. And uh, in, instead of accepting to share, he wanted everything. Mom Boucher at the end was making six million dollars a month, but he didn't want to share. He was too greedy, and that's what started the war. Violence in Montreal escalates. In 1994, Boucher issues an ultimatum for the drug dealers. They either work for him or for nobody else. The result? Biker gangs duel in the streets. Time and again, bombings terrify the city. Dozens of people in and around Montreal die during the biker war. People fear for their lives. The moment you want to become the only one in that market, I think you, you go one step further, one step above ordinary criminal, and you become what I would call a mafia, a mafia boss. Then Maurice Boucher crosses the line. The Hells Angels set off another car bomb in front of a rock machine hangout. One of the victims is an 11-year-old child, Daniel de Rocher. 
they saw the children fleeing across the street. The guy who pushed the bomb, he knew that that Jeep would blow up and that the kids were in danger, and yet he still pushed the bomb. So to me, that, uh, that's a heartless act and uh, an act of a coward even. And it shows to us that uh, the Hells Angels didn't care. And it was time to take them up. The killing of an 11-year-old boy, a middle-class kid, brings public opprobrium with it and pressure on the police and politicians to do something about it. And that killing was the turning point. Immediately, Montreal forms a 100-man special task force, the so-called Wolverines. But Boucher strikes back. He kills Diane Lavigne, the correctional officer, a randomly chosen victim. They are not psychopaths, at least in my opinion. They are certainly not sensitive to the damage they, they inflict on the people, but what they do is part of their strategy to pursue their empire building. Boucher's goal with the murders is to frighten the police and undermine their authority. But there is no solid evidence that the gang boss is behind it. Nobody knew at that time uh what had happened because she was a, a mother of two children, uh, not a guard who was known to be a, an aggressive guard at all. Uh, there was no reason for it, you know, and uh, everybody was looking for a reason and they investigated and interrogated and everybody checked, but uh, no, no reason was found at the beginning. A short time later, Hell's Angels boss Boucher has another correctional officer killed. The assassins shoot Pierre Rondeau, a prison bus driver. Meanwhile, investigators are certain the boss of the Hell's Angels is behind everything. They decide to take action. Now it was a confirmation. Now they came at us. Now it was sure that they were trying to get the system, the justice system, they were trying to uh, frighten them. We were 100% sure it was the Hells Angels. That for us was a turning point because that gave us uh, the goal to hit and hit and hit and hit. And we had to bring the war to them. And as of September, we brought the war to them. Whether Rock Machine or Hells Angels, the task force seizes weapons and arrests more and more gang members. Boucher can no longer protect his people people with whom he had worked had decided that they had been betrayed and went to the police. One of them, Stéphane Gagne, one of Boucher's closest confidants. He confirms that the gang boss is behind the murders. Investigators strike immediately and arrest the leader of the Hells Angels. Maurice Boucher is indicted for multiple homicide. The public and investigators tensely await his conviction. But then something incredible happens. The court acquits Boucher for lack of evidence. It's a slap in the face for Bouchard. To see him walk out, uh, you, you can't understand how you feel inside. You know, you feel empty. Uh, one of the, the worst days of our life, uh, because all the work that we put in, uh, hundreds and thousands of hours of work to get him, we had him, poof, and it was gone. The acquittal is an unparalleled defeat for police. Boucher, the boss of the Hells Angels, is in fact released. It's never, no one's really understood why he was let off in that original trial. It could be that he was intimidating witnesses or intimidating the jury, who one doesn't know. But investigators and the prosecutor appeal the case. And this time, the court appears to be neither biased nor bribed. Boucher is guilty. The sentence, life in prison. My police officer who was at the scene uh, when he arrested him, said to mom, Look outside, it's the last time you're gonna see the sun. Boucher, a man who makes millions a year with blackmail and drugs behind bars.
The biker war is over, leaving behind an estimated death toll of over 160. Mambushi was a ruthless killer. He killed children, he killed a woman. He preyed on the most vulnerable people here in Montreal. He is presently in jail. I think he'll stay in jail. I think he'll die in jail, and that's what he deserves. Boucher is still in a high security prison. The fate of this once mighty Hells Angels boss seems forever sealed. Although rumor has it up to this day that Boucher and his former gang members are still right in control. Gang bosses. They commit terror attacks and kill the innocent. Bribery, drugs, contract killings. Their greed knows no limits. He believed that he was somehow semi-divine. Sicily, home to the legendary mafia clan Cosa Nostra. For a good 20 years, one underworld boss rules the Italian island, Salvatore Rina, a ruthless killer. Everyone who gets in his way must reckon with death. He and his group massacred over a thousand people in the space of two or three years. The gang boss wages a war against all of Italy. The Mafia was always brutal and shrewd, but Rina makes it a terrorist organization. How can investigators stop the brutal mafioso? Palermo, Sicily's capital. Since the early 19th century, the idyllic Mediterranean island has been home to the most notorious Mafia clan of all. Its name, Cosa Nostra. In English, our thing. Its most brutal leader ever, Salvatore Rina. The press also calls him La Belva, the beast. Pier Giorgio Morosini devotes just about his entire career to fighting the gang boss. He's one of Italy's most famous mafia hunters. Without the Mafia, I probably wouldn't be here today. It's a criminal organization. It always stands opposed to justice and is terribly brutal. I simply can't accept that. Fighting the Mafia was always unbelievably important for our country. It is a defense of democracy. The history between Morosini, the mafia hunter, and Rina, the gang boss, has been tightly interwoven for decades. It all begins in 1930. Salvatore Rina is born the son of humble farmers in the Sicilian town of Corleone. At the age of 12, he unexpectedly loses his father to a World War II bomb. Rina must feed his family and finds a new role model, the Mafia boss, Stefano Ligio Bontate. The organization and the capo, the big boss, uh, becomes a substitute, a substitute father and mentor for the, for the young man. And so Rina would do anything for, for Ligio and very quickly made his way up the hierarchy. To become a member of the Mafia, Rina must first earn the organization's trust. The rules are strict. Rina must commit a murder. Such an important job, such as murdering somebody, is a way to, to give your credentials to the family that you can be trusted in the future. At the age of 19, Rina kills for the first time in the name of the Mafia and goes to prison for it. With this killing, the future gang boss embarks on a path that will soon cost hundreds of people in Sicily their lives. In 
certainly going to prison is seen as part of the part of the game. You learn a great deal in prison. You gain respect in the outside world when you're in prison. Rina is released after seven years and continues killing for the Mafia. His goal? To get all the way to the top. In Sicily's capital, Palermo, he kills about 50 people who are standing in the way of Cosa Nostra. And of his own rise to power. Rina pursues a bloody power struggle and comes to the attention of investigators for the first time. Rina came at them unexpectedly because the authorities were actually not policing Sicily. But at first, everyone thinks the gang boss is small fry. That changes in December of 69. Rina gathers allies and storms the house of a rival mafia boss. A war between the clans ensues. This homicide not all the Mafia families accepted this hit. Many opposed it. It was a full-scale assault with Wiener in the lead. The gang boss stages a massacre. The investigation shows the hit squad fires 108 shots at its foes. The upshot was that Ligio, the most important rival boss, handed over power to Totorina. This was the crucial moment. At the time, Pier Giorgio Morosini is part of the anti-mafia unit and wants to take down the gang boss. But Rina infiltrates the police, bribes investigators, and expands his extortion and drug business. The Sicilian Mafia is a federation of crime families. He wanted to become the boss of all of them. That was his goal, ultimately. For nearly 20 years, Rina wages a war against other Mafia clans. And the Italian state. At first, Morosini's hands are tied. He doesn't know who we can trust and who we can't. And not even one photograph of Rina exists. No one knows who he is. A nightmare for investigators. It was very hard to find Rina in Palermo. He was invisible and had a large network helping him, including the police. Gang boss Rina uses this impotence and becomes more brutal than before. In 1983, he eliminates the leaders of the last big rival Mafia family and definitively takes power in Palermo. Violence didn't really af affect him emotionally. He and his group uh, massacred over a thousand people in the space of two or three years. The few investigators Rina can't bribe try to find out where the gang boss is hiding. But even the people protect and respect Rina. I mean, the mafioso is not just an ordinary criminal. He's not just a robber or a thief or a rapist. He's somebody who has a standing in the community, and the community recognizes authority. And so that's why it's much harder to catch these mafia bosses. Morosini's combined efforts to track down the boss of the bosses go up in smoke. The situation was very hard for us. Rina was invisible, but was still committing brutal killings. Achieving our goal required a lot of patience. Investigators develop a plan. Largely unnoticed by the Mafia, they managed to expand the anti-Mafia unit 
with people they trust. They monitor bank accounts, spy on Rina's confidence, and try to win over the people. It has taken a long time for the police to be trusted so that people could inform on, on mafia bosses. And then, Rina's cruelty itself provokes the crucial turning point. For years, we fought the Mafia. We remained very patient, surveilled all Rina's contacts, all the people in his circle. And the biggest contribution came from the mafiosi themselves, when the Mafia bosses working for Rina decided to talk to us. After 10 years of extremely brutal violence, even the mafiosi themselves fear the boss of the bosses and spill the beans. Their offer? Mild prison sentences in return for information. The result is the so-called maxi trials. Imagine if you have 500 uh, defendants, imagine each of them has got a, a team of lawyers, imagine how many thousands of people have to be accommodated. The Mafia insiders give everything away about the structure of Rina's organization, his hitmen, and much more. This was a serious blow to him in terms of, of human resources for his organization. Each mafiosi who comes clean brings investigator Morosini and his team closer to the boss of the bosses. The Mafia kingpin's reaction is surprising. After so many killings, so much bloodshed, there is actually a respite. But it was a calm based on fear. Rina still controlled everything, but he was out of sight, untraceable, in hiding. This was possible because hundreds of people were still protecting him, people who owed him something. Rina secretly plans his revenge. A brutal assassination follows. The gang boss sets off a car bomb. Its goal, to kill Paolo Borsellino, high-ranking judge and sworn enemy of the Mafia. Borsellino and five others die. His decision was to, to kill the prosecutors and the police officers that were investigating the Mafia. And that was just a step too much. But Rina goes even further. A little later, he kills a magistrate, Italy's number one mafia hunter. For Italians, the Carpaccio massacre is like the murder of the Kennedy brothers. It was terrible, like Bobby and John Kennedy, or even like Martin Luther King. In May of 92, an assassin plants 400 kilograms of TNT under the highway. The target, Magistrate Giovanni Falcone. The explosion kills him, his wife, and three bodyguards. Investigator Morosini still mourns the loss of the mafia hunter, one of his best friends. I remember it very well. These images are burnt into the memory of thousands of Italians. There was a huge hole. The earth opened up. It was dramatic. The whole highway destroyed. It looked like pictures after a bombing. The assassination rocks all of Italy. The public's mood shifts. They fear the terrorism gripping their home. No one forgives Rina for the murder of Falcone and his wife. They were finally all united in their opposition to Rina and the Mafia organization, which was destroying their lives. And this was enough to destroy Rina and all of his people, it was game over for the Sicilian Mafia for the foreseeable future.
And eventually somebody within his own uh, team informed the authorities of where he was. What the anonymous witness reveals sounds unbelievable to investigators. After a good 20 years of bloodshed, they realize Rina has lived the whole time in Palermo, protected by mafiosi and corrupt police. January of 93, investigators arrest Italy's most brutal mafia boss in his hideout. The trial lasts a whole three years. The verdict, 13 life sentences. The fight is over. Rina's arrest was a big win for the state. It avenged the sacrifice of so many Italians. And where Salvatore Rina used to live is now a symbol of Italy, a police station. It is the proof that Italy stood up to Cosa Nostra. And of course, we will continue to fight. Salvatore Rina has been behind bars for about 30 years, waiting to die. The drug lord of Colombia, Pablo Escobar. For power and wealth, he even risks peace in his own country. His crimes made him the mightiest boss of all. For decades, he's always a step ahead of his hunters. We had to wait for Escobar to make his first ever mistake. Burnt out drug huts in the jungle, soldiers in the streets. A war is raging in Colombia. How does Escobar manage to bring an entire country to its knees? Car theft, kidnapping, even in his youth, Escobar had one goal in particular, to make as much money as possible. It's only with drugs that the amount of profit you make is just skyrocketing. At the age of only 26, Escobar begins smuggling hard drugs on a large scale. His drug farms quickly produce an unbelievable 300 tons of cocaine per year. Colombia is marked by corruption and poverty in this period. Escobar does what all gang bosses do. He bribes everyone who can help him or who could become dangerous. General Octavio Vargas Silva's task, to hunt Escobar and put him and his men under lock and key. In 1989, we started investigating the Medellin cartel. The state court put me personally in charge of and made me responsible for investigating the cartel's criminal activities. Vargas's approach is to catch the little fish first. Above all, dealers and hitmen from whom he hopes to get more information. Investigators arrest cocaine dealers conduct raids, seize millions, without making the crucial breakthrough. The problem, Escobar uses his drug money in part to build hospitals, social housing, and schools. He's considered a kind of good Samaritan, styles himself a pop star of the people. He used that reputation to be protected by the community. As soon as anything suspicious from the outside was going on in Medellin, Pablo would know about it straight away. The homeless, poor families, even children work for Escobar. They spy everywhere and warn the gang boss. Vargas and Escobar are often only a few hundred meters apart but every time, the drug lord manages to give the bloodhounds the slip. Then Escobar has had enough of playing cat and mouse and sets an example. 
the guerrilla force occupies Colombia's Palace of Justice. The assault was fierce and cruel, an assault on democracy. It's still difficult to talk about. It hurts. The intruders take 300 hostages. Over 100 of them die. The rebels also destroy all the documents. He loved the power. He loved the money. He loved everything that went, that went with it, the control over people. I'm sure that he believed that he was somehow semi-divine. And this is only the beginning. Escobar's next step is to have himself elected to parliament. Escobar's motive for going into politics was primarily immunity, and thus to remain unpunished for his crimes. Vargas does not seize his investigations. With the support of Colombia's justice minister, he manages to destroy numerous drug labs. But Escobar doesn't dither for long. He simply has the justice minister killed Colombia sinks into chaos. This is not just a police investigation. This is a war. Next, Escobar's assassins kill presidential candidate Luis Carlos Galán, an avowed enemy of the drug mafia. The government responds by setting a bounty, two million US dollars for Escobar's capture and investigators change their tactics. Now, all it was was an intelligence operation. Vargas needs insider information. And indeed, an informant reveals where Escobar is hiding. But the gang boss is clever. There are also numerous children in the house. The police can't risk their death. Mission aborted. Escobar escapes and continues with his war of terror. First, he blows up the Colombian intelligence headquarters in Medellin. Then he blows up the fully booked Avianca flight 203. All those on board die. Escobar overstepped the boundaries and that's when the state had to react and it was a full frontal fight. Once again, investigator Vargas must change his tactics. He starts the elite unit search block. It is Colombia's last hope in the fight against Escobar. Search block's goal was first to discover who belonged to the cartel. Secondly, to disarm them and thirdly, to arrest their leaders and all others. This actually seems to scare the powerful drug lord. He fears getting caught and extradited to the US. Escobar turns himself in. But the gangster boss has demands. He wants a private prison, built according to his own design. What he saw in that was a recognition from the Colombian state that he is an equal actor and player. In the mountains of the city of Medellin, the gang boss builds his own prison, the so-called cathedral. The prison is like a palace. Luxury kitchen, roulette table, and a prison bed that Escobar, from time to time, shares with prostitutes, all included. For Vargas, it is a bitter setback. The gang boss is playing games with the entire country. It was never a prison. It is a disgrace to the murdered and to the victims that Pablo Escobar has on his conscience. Escobar makes exactly the same drug deals as before, just using his own prison as a base. 
the Colombian government permits it. In a sense, the, the government is not as strong as, as we might think of other governments. So it is better to try to find a way to accommodate or to discuss or to reduce some of his activities uh, as opposed to try to make him pay for the crimes he committed. A good year later, things change. Vargas convinces the government to put Escobar in a real prison. The gang boss flees. His downfall, Escobar has a satellite telephone with him. The police know it and hope to locate him. We knew we were close. The drug lord moves around aimlessly, trying to hide his tracks. but the noose around Escobar's neck continues to tighten. We had to wait for Escobar to make his first ever mistake. And then it happens. Escobar uses the telephone repeatedly. He calls his family again and again. He wants to know if his wife and children are okay. Investigators locate the signal and find the house where the drug lord is hiding. Pablo Escobar was here. The special unit storms the house. A wild firefight breaks out. Escobar tries to escape from the roof. They had very little scruples about whether they got him alive or dead, and they were as happy to see him dead as they were alive. Famously said it's better to die in Colombia than in an American jail, and eventually that's what happened to him. Vargas's special unit shoots Escobar during his attempted escape. His body riddled with bullets. Escobar's death means the end of General Vargas's grueling hunt for the perhaps mightiest drug boss in history. It was all finally over on December 2nd, 1993. Investigators and all of Colombia can finally breathe a sigh of relief. The long-lasting drug war that the gang boss waged against his own country is over. Gang bosses all crave power, money, and control. These criminals will stop at absolutely nothing until investigators catch them, or they suffer the same fate as their victims. <laughs>